morning. Yeah, my name is Andy, and I am one of the pastors here at St. Nick's. I'm a curate, um, and I'm also a church planting curate. Uh, Dave mentioned we're planting Concord Church. Uh, so just as I get started, I'd love to give you a bit of an update of where we, where we are, where we've been over the last few weeks, and where we're going uh, as we build up to the launch of Concord Church. Uh, you might be thinking, what on earth is Concord Church? I've never heard of that, and now you're telling me for the first time, as if I already knew. Uh, well, we're planting a new church uh, in the north of the city in Filton, on Filton Air. Field, uh, where they're building loads and loads of new houses. Uh, we're planting a church into the Aerospace Museum uh, in, in Filton uh, called Concord Church. Um, we're calling it Concord Church because we're inspired by the sort of heritage, by uh, this amazing plane, this pioneering feat of engineering. Um, but also, actually, it's not that we're named after a plane. We're inspired by it. But this word Concord, uh, it means sort of unity, symphony, harmony. And I kind of feel like God is drawing together these little pockets of community around Filton and in the, north, uh, the northern fringe of Bristol. And he's bringing them together in unity uh, in Jesus. He is the reconciler of peace. He is the author of peace and lover of concord, is what it says in the Book of Common Prayer, a very Anglican prayer. So... The update is, we, we've, got a, we've been meeting over the last few months, uh, we've been having these exploration days, um, you may have heard of them, you may not have, it's not too late to explore coming with us on this church plant, I would love to speak to you if you think, actually, I might, this might be me, I can feel, maybe this could be me, maybe I am called to plant a new church in the north of the city, um, but we've been meeting uh, for these sort of exploration days, for people who want to explore what it is that we're doing, and whether God is calling them to come with us. And we've been meeting as a community every other week for those that are sort of committed uh, to Concord. And um, we're starting to gather uh, momentum as we go towards Focus, uh, as Hattie and Matt shared earlier. At Focus, we're going to be sent out as part of the HTB network. They'll probably get us on the stage and our name will appear on the screen for about two seconds. Um, and, uh, and they'll pray for us and send us out. Um, but also in the, um, in the sort of, in our camp at St. Nick's camp, we're going to be praying for Concord and we're going to be blessing that and commissioning that as well. Um, so if you're coming to Focus, that's something to look forward to. Um, and then after Focus, uh, we're going to be gathering in August for some barbecues and some sort of prayer evenings at our house as we sort of uh, build up to the launch, which is coming at the beginning of September, which is what I want to tell you about. And um, we're launching on the 4th of September. We're giving a, doing a commissioning here in the morning service, 10.30. Um, so if you, want to, if you want to be involved in that, do come on that Sunday, that's the 4th of September, to pray for the team, pray for everyone being sent out to Concord. Um, that's on the 4th. On, on the the 8th, uh, there's a sort of a civic celebration in the evening with the bishop and that kind of thing. But the, the launch day is Sunday the 11th of September. Uh, put it in your diaries. If you want to come and get involved, that's the day we're launching. 10.30 at the Aerospace Museum, 10 o'clock, copy and pastries, you know the drill. Come and get involved if you would like to. Um, we've, we've been sort of building team over the summer. We've appointed uh, an amazing children's pastor, Abby Bouchier is going to be our children's pastor and family's pastor. Um, and Sarah Rowe is going to be our operations and office manager. So we're really excited about some of the staff team. But I'm also absolutely buzzing for the amazing volunteers, people who are part of Concord already, and everyone who's going to join, um, who's going to serve in loads and loads of different ways. So that's Concord. That's the update. I was probably about, what, three minutes, four minutes? That's okay. That's eating into my time. But the reason we are doing church planting, the reason we're doing this is because of our calling to spread the good news. I need some sunglasses on. The sun is like directly in my face. Can I take a step? No, I'll take a step. No, I can't actually go anywhere. Never mind. Um, I'm just going to be blinded for the whole thing. Um, it's our heart to tell people the good news of Jesus. Uh, we want to revitalize churches, bring new churches to life in the city. The narrative in society is that the church is dead, God is dead with it, and nothing can be good, nothing good can come out of Christianity. And we want to say no. We want to bring churches back to life. Those that are, that are in decline, we want to regenerate and rejuvenate those churches. But in areas such as Filton, uh, on the airfield where there isn't currently a church, we want to start a new church of a live faith. And it's our vision for this city to revitalize churches, to see communities of good news for the community and the, the city that we live in. And as we've been preaching on Jonah over the last few weeks, we've been, we've been sort of repeating this motto, we're in the city for the city. And that doesn't just mean the city center, that means the whole thing and beyond. You know, we, the good news is for the whole world. 
We've got a vision. It's to play our part in the evangelization of the nation. That is, tell people about Jesus. You know, most of us, I mean, I, I was brought up kind of in a, in a Christian home, but I didn't even, I had no idea what the gospel was. I came to faith when I was about 18. I, found, I thought I was a sort of atheist at that point, and I'd never really heard it in a way that I could understand. So we want to tell people the good news. We want the evangelization of the nation, the revitalization of the church. That's what we, that's what we want to do. We want to bring churches to life. We want to have a living faith in every single community. And we want to transform society. The transformation of society is the final part of our vision. And we want to engage with uh, the, the world around us, the needs, those uh, structures that are unjust. We want to, we want to play a part in, in changing those, making it more like the world that we know God wants it to be. And it all comes from Jesus and the good news. And his good news for us is grace. And as we've been going through this Jonah series, tonight I'm going to be bringing it to a close as we wrap up this series of being in the city for the city in a book that in all its weird and wonderful ways is all about God's grace, his story of love for the city of Nineveh and his love for Jonah. So I've got a second reading for us this evening. I hope you're holding tight. We're going to go to Luke 15 uh, verse 11. It's one of my favorites. It's the story of the parable son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, as a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out to him and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So what has the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal father, and the older brother got to do with this story of Jonah? Well, I feel that there is some strong links between Jonah's actions in this story and those that we see in this parable. He is both the younger son and somehow also the older son within this story. Now, a quick overview of Jonah. Over the last few weeks, Matt and Helen uh, did an amazing job preaching uh, of what this, is, what this has been and what Jonah is, the sort of setting. So I'd recommend listening back. You can find it on Spotify. What I do, put it on 1.2 speed. It gets, gets over a little bit. You can still understand it. Um, brilliant job. Um, but a very short overview of that. Jonah, instructed by God to preach against this city of Nineveh. 
And the Assyrians, uh, where Nineveh is, they, you know, they, they, they were being awful towards the Israelites. They were renowned for their sort of cruelty and the way that they were oppressing uh, Israel. And uh, it, it's known that their wickedness had come before God. This is what God said to Jonah. Um, I know about their wickedness. And so God gives, them, uh, God gives Jonah a, a mission. Go to Nineveh and tell them, God knows what you're doing. God knows the wickedness that's within you. That was all he had to do. And we know the story. Jonah runs away. He gets, uh, he, he gets the complete... He goes the complete opposite way to Tarshish. He, uh, he jumps on a boat, and instead of going to where he needs to go, he says, I'm sorry, God, I'm refusing. I'm going to go this way, my own way. And this is a story of a city that, because of their wickedness, is heading towards destruction. And this, this, sort of, this message is to tell them, if you carry on like that, that's the way this is going. And also, we see Jonah going towards his destruction as well. And Helen talked a few weeks ago about obeying God's call. And Jonah, he was the one who was supposed to be doing God's work. You know, he's the one, he's this sort of prophet type figure that's supposed to be able to sort of speak the truths that God has for the city, for, for the nations. And um, it it's, turns out in this story that the prophet, the one who's supposed to be the good guy, is actually the bad guy, and the city of Nineveh, which is supposed to be the bad guy, sort of turns out to be the good guy, the one that actually repents and does the right thing. Now, if you put yourself in Jonah's position, it's probably understandable that you don't want to go to a city of people that hate you and tell them that they're all really wicked and destruction is coming. It feels like that's not going to go down that well. Um, So he runs away, runs away from God. And what we see is chaos and destruction follows Jonah. There's something sort of philosophical about Jonah stepping out of the instruction and the rule of God and saying, no, I'm going to do this my own way. And it's almost like the inevitable happens in this situation, that away from the source of love and life and grace and mercy it leads to chaos. It's chaos, the waters sort of trembling around this boat that Jonah's got on to Tarshish and taking it. And then Jonah realizing the only way for me to escape is to take my own life, to jump into the waters. He's running away from God, disobeying him. And I kind of feel like this is a little bit like the prodigal son. I don't know if we've got any prodigals in the house. I was, I'm a bit of a prodigal every now and again. Um, I, I, I kind of get that, you know, you get those feelings where you want to just sort of do your own thing. It's like, I just want to do what I'm told. I just, sorry, I just want to do what I, I feel. And uh, the prodigal in this story, in this story of the prodigal son, he, he says to his father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. You know, back then, that was the most awful thing you could do to your parent. It's effectively saying, I wish you were dead. I would like your possessions. Thank you. Nowadays, with millennials not being able to afford deposits for housing, sometimes this conversation happens uh, where you say, could I have my inheritance a little bit early for a deposit? Um, But back then, it was horrendous. It was the worst thing you could do. It was saying, I want your stuff, but I don't want you. So the son makes the decision. He leaves the household. He takes the plunge, leaves the family, says to his father, you're dead to me. Just like Jonah rejects God. And Jonah's problem, and I think the prodigal son's problem, was was the same as what we sometimes have. This kind of false conviction that if we fully surrender our will to God, he, he won't really be committed to our goodness and our joy He's, gonna, he's not really trustworthy. We, we can't really trust him to have our backs. But what we see here is when you head down that path, it leads to destruction. The things that we want to orientate our lives around, if, if not God, they fail us eventually. The money runs out. Relationships end. Football teams get relegated. Boats sink. And Jonah thinks he is the God of his own world. That he's like, actually, I'm going to step out of God being God. I'm going to be God for a minute. I I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Tarshish. But is that something that you guys resonate with? You know, putting yourself sometimes before all else? 
rejecting God in the day-to-day -day because actually it's, maybe it just feels a bit easier in the moment. But what we see is that even in Jonah's kind of failings and disobedience, the Father is patient. God is patient with those who reject him. He is merciful to sinners, yet he will bring justice to the wicked. And so quite often, we get to this point of the story where Jonah jumps in the water, the whale eats him, um, he's in the belly for three days, and then he, he, you know, he changed his mind. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do what you say, God, I'll go to Nineveh. And, and then that's it. That's the story, right? The whale transforms G, uh, Jonah's life. Uh, he goes back. Um, but we miss out on this really important second failing of Jonah. It's the less glamorous bit. You know, you hear Jonah and the whale, you don't hear about Jonah and the tree. Um, which is the thing that we're going to talk about right now. Because the second part of Jonah's story, it sort of resonates with the older brother in the prodigal son story. And the beginning, we see it in the beginning of chapter 4 of Jonah, where Jonah gets angry, and he thinks Nineveh should be destroyed. And this merciful God has, has shown uh, Nineveh that it, it needs to turn, change its ways, and it's done that. Nineveh has done that. They take on sackcloth and ashes, and they say, you know, we need to repent. We need to change what we're doing because we're gonna, it's going to lead us to destruction. Maybe they don't necessarily uh, come under sort of believing people, believers, um, but, but they know that they need to do the right thing. And so, to some extent, the sort of injustice has finished it's, it's happened. He's got what he wanted, Jonah wanted. But what we're seeing now, all of a sudden, Jonah's got something else. There's something that isn't right going on with Jonah. And, um, the, you know, his, his sin starts to come out. You know, the things that we cling to in life, when we, the things that we put uh, before God, they soon become the things that control us. You know, Jonah, he had this passion and this hatred. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. But then all of a sudden, the things that he wanted, Nineveh to stop, to stop, stop sort of doing its awful things, has started to happen. But yet something is controlling Jonah. You know, it's no longer about justice for him. Jonah wants revenge. And he has a massive tantrum and sits under a tree outside the city of Nineveh. And in uh, verse four, verse two, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, he, he's speaking to God, and he kind of berates him. He says, I know that you're a gracious and compassionate God. And he, he's sort of like, he's, re he's replying sort of Exodus. Uh, there's a passage in Exodus 34 where it says, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He's kind of, he's, he's reciting that back to God, but he's missing out the justice part, the bit about the guilty being punished. And he's saying, you're just going to let them off for this. Jonah stands as the judge over Nineveh in this moment. He says, I don't accept your mercy, God. I don't accept that. I think we need revenge. They need to be annihilated. And so for Jonah, he has this idol in his heart. This thing that he's put up that's even higher than God, it's revenge. It's nationalism, maybe. Maybe it's uh, some, some sort of political vendetta that he has. And Jonah is like the older brother in this. He's part of the family of God, but he's not living like it. He doesn't understand that being part of God's family, being under God's rule, being obedient to God, means taking on that grace and mercy that God has for his people. You see, this, the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, he takes himself away from the party. He's standing outside where the fun stuff is happening, and he's looking at it, and he's standing in judgment over it. And he looks at his younger brother, and he says, gosh... He's not as righteous as I am. He has not been slaving for years. He's just gone away, flaunted and spent all this money. And then he's come back and you're rejoicing over what? A sinner. But he's not living as the father intends him to. He spent all these years in the household thinking of, his, thinking of himself as a slave. When really he's a child of the father. One who has his affection and his love. One who 
actually want, needs to take part in the joy and grace and mercy that the Father extends. And so what is in our heart tonight? What are the things that perhaps we sometimes put above God, the things that we don't want to let go of? Perhaps, uh, perhaps it's politics. Perhaps it's those other, the other side of the, uh, of the aisle, as it were, that we, that we, that we just think they're so awful. I'm, we're so much better than them. They've just got the wrong idea. Um, or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's something different, completely different. Maybe your idol tonight is busyness, just feeling like you've got to be busy. Maybe it's the same as the older brother. It's righteousness. You, know, you feel like, actually, my righteousness is more important. Like how I, you know, what, who I am is more important than obey, obeying God and loving others. Maybe it's perfectionism. Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's power. Maybe there's something in our hearts that is sort of good, but it's been distorted. Something that our, our desires have been twisted. And actually now, it kind of holds a little bit of us. It's the thing that, you're say, that you'd say, yeah, God, I'm willing to follow you, but, but don't take that bit. That's the one thing that I'm going to kind of hold on to. That's the one thing I'm not really going to give to you, God. I'm not going to give you my future. Mm, I know I definitely can't. I definitely can't. I, I, I can only really be friends with those people because those people, I don't really like them so much. And, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be comfortable, God. And actually, maybe I'm going to put my comfort first. Or maybe it's something completely different. God exposes in Jonah and the, older, the father and the older brother those idols in the hearts of them. And these paths, they lead to destruction. It's inevitable whether in this life or when we die, if, if God is the God of the universe who created all things and sustains all things, which means he always gives them life. He's the one who continually chooses to keep things existing. He could literally just decide, I don't want to sustain life anymore. I'm going to end everything. And God could do that. He is all powerful. Yet he doesn't. He sustains it every single day. He gives us free will to choose to be obedient to the God who created absolutely everything. We don't, we don't have to be obedient, but we kind of want to because actually that's right. It's, it's, not, it's not so much that, that sort of disobeying God. God is like, I'm going to punish you right now for disobeying me. It's kind of inevitable. If you step out of the sort of rule and kingdom of the one that brings life, goodness, mercy, graciousness, all of the good things, order, you step into chaos, darkness, everything that is outside uh, that of God, and annihilation. And it's in that spot of annihilation, destruction, that we find Jonah twice. He's... In the jumps into the sea, desperate, and then we find him having a tantrum outside the city. But God doesn't leave Jonah there. He doesn't leave us in our despair. God, Jonah runs, but God goes after him. God's grace follows him everywhere he goes. And um, he has this moment, Matt talked about it last week, in the belly of the fish. Three days. And he, he repents. He realizes the things that he's done wrong. And he draw, brings himself back under the rule of God. He has time to look inside and reflect on the things that he's done. And uh, it reminds me of Mark, 1, uh, Mark chapter 1 where God says, uh, where Jesus says, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent is a word that you might hear on the streets from street evangelists, and it might hit you funny. You might be like, oh gosh, repent, that sounds so judgmental. Repent means turn your mind around. It means a sort of transformation, a realignment of your mind with the truth. It, it doesn't mean sort of, it doesn't mean I want to convince you, and it doesn't mean you need to sort of work at it. It just means realize the truth of the situation. Come back to God's way of thinking. 
And so Jonah's repentance, this important moment in the belly of the whale, in verse 9, he says this, salvation comes only from the Lord. And this is the pivotal moment of the whole book of Jonah. The whole, it's in the very middle of the book. It's what it's all talking about. That in all the things that Jonah is seeking, all of his passions and his, you know, his idols, the only way he's going to be saved is by the Lord. And maybe right now you need to turn around a moment. You need to shift your thinking to realize the truth of the idols that are in your life. Maybe there's things right now that you're like, actually, yeah, this is weighing on me. This is something I'm carrying. This is something that I haven't surrendered to God yet. Sins you've committed, things uh, that you've done, people you've hurt. You know, there is, there is nothing that leads to life and flourishing other than living under God's rule, love, and fatherhood. He is the one that brings all of it. He's the only one that can. These idols have to fall. And so when we repent, we confess our sin. We say sorry. We turn to him. And then we believe in him. There's a moment where Jonah realizes it's his sin that is causing the destruction of the others on the boat. And he throws himself, almost sacrificially, to, to save them, sort of. And it's kind of like this twisted version of the gospel, where for, for Jonah's sake, he's sacrificing, sorry, for their sake, Jonah's sacrificing himself because of his own sin. Whereas with Jesus, he sacrifices himself for our sin, to save all of us. You know, we don't get what we deserve. And Jonah didn't get what he deserved. He probably deserved to die. He was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw myself in. That's what's going to happen. Destruction. But God saves him because he's loving and merciful and kind. And then he saves him again. Uh, he saves him sort of in the belly, by the belly of the fish. But then he saves him again by removing this idol. There's this, the, Jonah and the tree is the situation Jonah finds himself, where a tree is shading him from the red-hot heat. Can anybody empathize or sympathize with Jonah right now? I think we can in this day and age with this kind of weather, um, where he's being shaded by this plant. And God says, I'm going to reveal to you something that's in your heart about the city. And um, he, he points out that actually God has made this, made this tree exist. And, um, and actually, he's the one that has the right to save Nineveh. Actually, it's his judgment, his mercy that matters. And um, I, I love how in, the, in, the, in this story, as well as in this parable, um, we see that despite the failings of Jonah, despite the failings of the city, it's God's character to love, to have mercy on each and every one of us, those that are, uh, are supposed to be walking the path following God and um, that have somehow run away from him, but those that are holding uh, idols in their hearts, things that they, we put a, above God. And um, he, he saves Jonah in the belly of the whale and reinstates him as his messenger and there's something about that in, a, in this story of the prodigal where the son comes home and he comes back saying, I am rubbish. I am, you know, I'm destined for destruction. I'm supposed to be a servant in your, in, in your household. Just let me be the lowest of the low. And the father sprints to him. He throws his robe over him. He puts his ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and says, no. I reinstate you. You're part of the family. Have uh, my mercy. Have my abundance. And so as we, as, we, uh, as we repent, as we change our minds, as we come back, we believe that God is going to do something to welcome us back. He has performed a miracle for us. Our salvation has been, has been bought by the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You know, what we were destined for, destruction, he has made a way that we would have eternal life in him. Nineveh repented. It stopped doing what they were doing. And for us, it's never too late for us to turn back to God. He is kind. He is loving. He has mercy for each of us. And like Jonah, we need to repent of the idols 
You know, I kind of feel like Jonah did. Otherwise, how did we get the story? He, he, prob- you know, he, he didn't die in the desert outside the city. He, he survives. Um, and he realized, gosh, actually, yeah, maybe I need to go back in. Maybe I need to show mercy to this place. You know, for us, we need to acknowledge the truth that Jesus is Lord. He is the only route to salvation. And to believe that God has made a way for us to come back under his rule, his fatherhood, to serve him, to love him as he loves us, his children who he accepts with open arms. So I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for these stories. And Lord, we, we know that we, we have the tendency to do the same, to put other things before you. God, whether it's ourselves or whether it's things in the world, Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for our failings. And you would help us to see the truth, Lord, for all these different areas of our lives, for the things unseen and seen the things that we don't know about. Lord, we pray you'd help enlighten us to know your truth. And Lord, help us to walk in your way. Help us to believe in you each and every day, to trust you with our lives, to trust that you are working for our good, that you care for us, you are merciful for all of your creation. And Lord, I pray for us right now that you'd help us to know your love for us here in this place. And that you would tear down the idols of our hearts. Thank you, Lord.